Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to our latest education series webinar. I'm Diane Byrne. I am the vice chair of the U.S. Super Yacht Association and the chair of our education committee. We have a great presentation for you today, a very timely presentation too about cyber risk management. There's been plenty of discussion over the years, including among our members, about cyber risk and cybersecurity. And this to me, quite honestly, is the only one that I know of that's really giving you the top down and bottom up perspective of what you can and should do with your company starting now to really mitigate risk. You know, Actually, before we jump into the discussion, um, I do want to make sure I do one thing really quickly. I do want to make sure that we see, we thank our sponsor for this because without our sponsors, we would not be able to continue bringing you these education series webinars. So our sponsor for this program is Burger Boat Company. You can see them at burgerboat.com and of course contact Jim or Ron directly. Their contact information is in our directory. So, um, Today's discussion, mitigating cyber risk to sum up attacks and stay ahead of upcoming regulations. We have our moderator, Melissa Orlick from Isotropic Networks and also one of our board members. And our panelists are Ben Dyken from Atlas Cybersecurity, Corey Ranslam from International Maritime Security Associates, and Steve Boba from Hillard Heinz. They are going to lead you through the steps you can and should take to mitigate your risk and keep your company as secure as possible, as well as shed some light on some regulations that are upcoming that many of us are going to need to adhere to. So Melissa, please take it away. Thank you, Diane, and thanks for the warm welcome, especially thanks to Burger Boat Company for the sponsorship and support, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, as Diane mentioned, the discussion of cyber risk has obviously been a hot topic. Uh, we know some things have happened this year alone, um, and especially in today with businesses grappling from the pandemic, economic crisis, now is obviously not the time to be dealing with any cyber attacks that can be detrimental to business. So today is our wake up call. We're gonna start planning, start preparing, and we're gonna start by having a conversation on a few key areas that our panelists will cover today. A few of them will be cybersecurity ecosystem, third party risk management, and as Diane mentioned, regulations that are to come. So to start things off, I'm gonna spearhead over to Steve. And Steve, as you and I briefly discussed, cybersecurity ecosystems, as I understand them, are set up to operate similar to an immune system where healthy devices are defecting, are defecting infected de devices. Can you elaborate a little bit further on this, perhaps how this ecosystem is beneficial, not only to large companies, but for a small family office, even possibly in the yacht world? Sure, be happy to, and thanks, Melissa. And, and again, thanks to uh, all the participants joining uh, today. So the cybersecurity ecosystem is, you know, cybersecurity means a lot of things, uh, different things to different people. And so first and foremost, you want to take time to understand what the threats are uh, out there, first and foremost. So understanding the difference between phishing, spear phishing, whaling, CEO fraud, um, a hacker cracker kind of activity, uh, making sure that you understand that these are the risks that you're going to be facing every day. Uh, you hear terms like ransomware, spyware, malware, grayware. Um, these are all terms that, that in some form or function um, can have a negative impact on your, your IT infrastructure and your, your data protection uh, activities. So understand those threats first and foremost. And once you start understanding the threats that pertain to you, then take time to take an inventory of the mitigation strategies that you're putting in place. You know, is a firewall required? Um, do you need to look at how your network is architected? Who's updating your devices? Are they always updated? Are they updated in real time? Um, or, or is it just as you have time? And then and again, that's where hackers are looking at or cyber criminals are looking at those vulnerabilities to then access your data uh, without your permission. So take time to understand your architecture and build it accordingly to what is going to mitigate the risks that are your, that are affecting you. Keep your devices updated. Um, I, I think that's that's often overlooked. I can tell you the number of times we go to clients, um, family offices, their residences, their businesses, and devices are two operating systems from being uh, up to date. 
and they don't understand uh, those vulnerabilities until you start explaining to them that the, the reason that there are patching and new releases and new updates are to patch the holes, the vulnerabilities that have been found within their operating systems. Um, installing antivirus protection on the devices is also key. I can't tell you the number of times that we've come across clients who don't do that, um, or they've had a subscription when they bought a computer, uh, but then it runs out. And so, you know, they forget to renew that subscription, and yet it's only as good as the signatures provided today. And what I mean by signatures, uh, antivirus companies put out, publish new signatures for virus identification and protection uh, multi -times, multiple times a day. And so, you know, making sure that those, those subscriptions stay real, uh, real-time updated uh, and active is what also helps protect your sy systems. And then lastly, um, for me, it's education. It's educating uh, the people who work in the family offices, who work in the, in, in the, in the, within the family residences, who work on the boats, you know, the, the crew members on the boats and things of that nature, um, ensure that they understand the risks that are facing um, the family in the family office. And so they don't fall victim to um, these types of specific attacks. Um, they need to be also, they need to be educated, they need to be trained, they need to be tested against uh, particular um, uh, threats like social engineering testing so that they become, it becomes second nature to identify those threats. And, and from there, you know, then you're, you're building that true ecosystem from a hardware software solution and then the human component perspective in protecting uh, your family and your, your family office digital assets. And that's a real high level view of the cybersecurity ec ecosystem. So would you, would you agree that organizations aren't necessarily prepared for the threats they're most concerned about? Uh, I would definitely agree with that. I, I can tell you the number of times we've walked in and, and, and the network is, is quite frankly, is architected in a flat nature, meaning it's wide open. Um, the um, wireless access points have been just added on. And of course, they still maintain the same uh, admin credentials uh, that have been put in place. Um, and so it's easily, we can show them how their networks are easily accessible. And, and once we start showing them, they start under, then they start getting a, a deeper appreciation for the threats that they're, that they're now facing. And, and then we help them mitigate those, those issues. So would you say that there's like a best practice to start sort of these ecosystems or if someone's just starting from the ground up, what's the best approach to sort of starting the questions, starting the planning, starting the education? Absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, you need to get an assessment. Um, uh, you need to have someone come in as a third party and, and have them look because they, one, they're going to have an understanding of what those risk threats and vulnerabilities are. And, and, and a lot of times they're based on controls like ISO 27001, uh, NIST 800-171, uh, COVID-5. So as long as they've got an understanding of those uh, best practices for information security, they can come in and then level set where your organization is, identify those gaps, and then help you then create a mitigation strategy towards addressing those, those um, unfulfilled gaps. So even if you are a small company and you don't necessarily have a huge IT department or an entire group that's specific towards protecting risk management on the cyber side, you can bring in outside parties to come in and do evaluations and build a whole ecosystem for you. Absolutely. Correct? Absolutely. And they don't have to, you don't have to build this large staff. Uh, again, there's, there's many firms out there that have built their, their business on supporting small business and small family offices um, in, in a secure manner. And, and you know, they're managed service services providers. And that way you don't have the overhead and the cost of a, of a, um, large IT organization, but you're getting the benefit of all the expertise in, in mitigating those, those vulnerabilities. And it's not just in it. And, and I, I please have to add this, that it's not a one and done kind of activity. Information security is an everyday ongoing activity. The threats change every day. And, and that's probably one of the hardest concepts for, for people to realize, except for when you start looking at our automobiles, we change our oil every 3,000 to 6,000 miles. Same thing with IT. It has to be ongoing. It's ongoing maintenance, ongoing um, uh, updates, ongoing firmware updates to keep those environments protected every day, all day. Well, that's also true for the cyber attackers too, because they obviously have to come up with new people to go after, new industries, 
uh, new types and things of that sort. So obviously what you've had in place a year ago, six months ago, may be different to what the attackers are doing today or tomorrow or in the future as well, right? Oh, absolutely. Again, it's, it's, that's why the, again, antivirus companies are publishing new uh, signature files multiple times a day because the threats changed that quick. Um, you know, years ago, uh, hacking was about notoriety, right? Every, all the hackers want to do is that they hacked uh, large corporations and, and they would get, you know, that notoriety. Today, it's about financial gain. So if individuals think because they're small, they're not a target, I would ask them to reconsider that, that concept because if there's a way for a, a, a cyber criminal to get a financial gain from them, and, and again, that can be 79, as low as $79 for most ransomware kind of attacks, up to multi-million dollar CEO fraud kind of uh, wire transfer uh, activities. Doesn't matter that you don't have to be a multinational organization anymore. It's, it's, it's wherever they can get that financial gain. And I think, what wasn't it? One of the Shark Tank uh, representatives was hacked earlier this year and held ransom for money as well, wasn't it? So yes. no matter the company, no matter who you are, it is, it can't happen. It, you, you are a target, and especially as we talk about, you know, the super yacht organization. And, and, and again, individuals who own super yachts are going to be targets because of their, their notoriety. Um, so. That's good. That's good. Well, I think with that, I'm going to segue it because we have some questions, I think, for third party risk then. Um, I'm going to switch over to Ben here. Uh, so I read in the Wall Street Journal this week, uh, there was an article titled, The Industry's Most Vulnerable Cyber Attacks and Why. And what I found most interesting was from the article, they provided their survey results. And from 400 companies, of those 400 companies, more than 70% saw third-party suppliers as a major threat, but less than 60% felt prepared. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I believe when Target had their credit card breach, what was it, in 2014, 13, something like that, the hack was actually through the HVAC company, which was a third-party company, not a direct hit. So with that, how do we sort of evaluate what we're doing in our own companies and what are we doing in looking at vendors, partners, is there stuff we're supposed to be doing? Because um, to be honest, I mean, I probably would never think that my HVAC company would be a threat to me um, outside, outside of the air conditioning failing, I guess. Yeah, no, uh, so I'm actually going to steal a little bit from what Steve started with because the same principles apply here. Um, the first step is really getting a grasp on and assessing who are my vendors, what kind of access are they given, how am I verifying and validating what they're doing with the access or data that I'm passing off to them. And when you think that when you start going into the world of third party risk, I mean, it, it becomes this massive web of vendors. Uh, and if you look at the super yacht industry, for example, I think it's a great kind of, I think we actually wrote an article on this at Atlas, uh, it's like a pyramid. You have the super yachts at the top, but no matter how much you defend the super yacht itself and the owners of the super yachts, there are all of these other players that are getting incredibly valuable data that are interacting directly with IT systems on the boats that are supporting them with goods, services, and whatever it might be. And you start seeing this massive pyramid that for one boat, there can be hundreds of people that touch it hundreds of, or not even people, organizations that touch it, and really working to say, who are my vendors? What risks do they pose to me? You know, for example, a management company is very different than a supply company. You know, someone who's, who's flying in supplies uh, still can potentially be an avenue of uh, attack, but maybe a little bit less concerning than, say, your management company, your AVIT support company, whoever it is that really is getting your critical data. And, you know, so once you've set that baseline, now you need to work with and understand uh, and control for the risks. So the first question is not how do I protect myself, but how am I exposed? What is my risk? And once you've properly calibrated your risk, now you want to start implementing pieces to actually control for it. So for example, we highly recommend uh, for every organization that we work with, no matter how sophisticated you want to be about it, have a vendor security questionnaire. Now we've worked with big banks and that questionnaire is 600 questions long. That's not what I'm recommending here. 
but have a place where you at least ask some key questions. What security controls do you guys have in place? If you have a security incident, am I getting notified about that? Uh, if, you know, how are you checking who at your company has access to this data? Is it a free for all? Do you have authentication mechanisms in place? It can really be five to 10 questions and you can orient yourself to see what do I need to instruct my vendors to do to mitigate that risk. And a really important consideration here is when we think about criminals, they're a hundred percent profit motivated today, but I also want to take the point that they are incredibly sophisticated. And I always like to jokingly say lazy. They can try to do a direct attack on, let's say, the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. That's a very hard task to go after because a Fortune 500 company pays millions and millions of dollars a year to their security team. They have massive security teams and they're not doing a great job, I'll be honest with you, but they're probably doing a better job than most organizations today. So the first thing the hackers are going to do is say, I'm going to not go directly. I'm going to take an alternate route you know what, this owner happens to be very public about the use of his super yacht. I'm going to start looking into that. And then, you know, the super yacht itself may be hard to get to. You know, maybe it's hard to scan. They don't have this level of knowledge around VSAT connectivity, whatever it might be that are the barriers to entry. But I know that the management company keeps, a, you know, a server on board to maintain all of the uh, ISPS documentation, something that we've seen management companies do. Well, now I get that little tidbit of information. I can go after the management company, but the attack that I'm going to launch against the management company is not designed to compromise them. It's not even designed to compromise the boat. I'm going to use the intelligence that I gather and work upstream all the way back to compromising that fortune 500 company. And the CEO, not as a person, not as a yacht owner, but as the CEO of that Fortune 500 company. So it's a very, very kind of interrelated uh, world. And once you give those criminals a foothold, they can cause real harm, not just to the direct relationship that you see, but to orders of magnitudes of relationships above that, which is why we really need to think about what is the exposure there. Would you so, say that this, I guess, more or less these minings that they're doing, it, would it be over a gradual period or is this something that they do quite quickly? So I mean, so, you might not see it today, but it could happen a year from now because it's taking them so long to get through the different threads. So that's a, an, a fantastic question. The simple answer is a long event horizon. Um, you know, the mean time to detection which is not for a third party risk case, but just internally to one link in that chain, according to a report from the Poneman Institute and IBM, is over 200 days from initial compromise until that malicious activity is detected. So sometimes it can be quick. Sometimes they get in and they go up the chain, but a lot of times a cyber attack is really an intelligence operation. The actual attack is very quick. But how do I gather all of my information? How do I know who all the players are? How do I see how they interact over email? How do they talk to each other? How can I replicate the language? You know, if Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, is famous that when he gets complaint emails, he has an open inbox to the world, he forwards it to the relevant manager with a question mark. And that manager knows if he gets a question mark in his inbox, he has 24 hours to get an answer. And that's a kind of behavioral heuristic. So how can a hacker replicate that behavioral heuristic when they choose to finally launch their attack? Uh, there's a process. It's, you know, we, we use different processes in the cyber community. You can use a kill chain taxonomy, the MITRE attack framework, whatever it is. But there are many steps involved. So a lot of it is much more slow, deliberate intelligence gathering than it is, you know, out of Swordfish the movie when the guy's sitting at the keyboard and boom, you know, you penetrate whatever it might be. It is slow, deliberate, and no one's in a rush here. So as far as, you know, when you implement everything on your side, and obviously you've gone through the steps of asking 
you know, your third party vendors, all of these things, but something still happens. Is there still a way, and I guess I'm gonna open this both to Steve and Ben, that you can have in your cyber ecosystem that is still protecting you in case they do get in through a third party? Sure. Um, again, as we talked earlier uh, about hardware, software solutions, you know, then you're looking at logging and, al and alarming and things of that nature. Um, so you look at your firewall and how it's constructed. And, and again, when you get um, those, those types of attacks that are coming through, you should have logging and alerting set on and someone should be looking at those, um, not in real time, but as been alluded to, you know, two, within less than 200 days, right? You saw um, at Hillard Heinz, we review our logs every 30 days just because of the fact of, of being a, a centralized target. So we're reviewing those, looking for those anomalies, and again, updating and protecting against those things that we're identifying. So it's those protective measures that you have in place to mitigate if someone does or is able to penetrate you know, the, uh, the, the risk identified by Ben. Uh, and I just wanna build on that. Another really important component here is something called threat intelligence. So, it turns out that criminals tend to attack organizations the same way. And it's not, the point of that is not to say, hey, Bill sitting at a computer is doing this. But if I, you know, for example, we are a, a real-time security monitoring company. I see what's going on at my client networks. I learn from that. And every, so if something wrong happens at one client and we detect it manually, I can now create an automated process to protect all of my clients from the exact same thing. So a big thing in security, is, as Steve very much alluded to, is it is hard to do things quickly. Not because the work is very hard, it, you know, it's detecting anomalous stuff, but because there's so much data. So when you have processes in place to centrally aggregate data, and start looking for the anomalous activity, behave, apply behavioral analytics, and automate effectively and efficiently. You know, I, I was like, say, we're technically a cybersecurity company, but if you ask my engineers who are working day in, day out, we're really an automation company. How do we apply the best intelligence? How do we apply the best human processes and automate so that we can iterate across all of our clients? Uh, and, and it's not an easy task and that's why cybersecurity is, is a, a difficult industry that we're constantly uh, feel like we're a step behind the criminal. But if you're looking for the results of an attack and you know, cause remember, we know the end result here. And if we work our way back, it doesn't matter if it's a third party attack, if it's a direct attack, if we know the end result, we can work our way back. Maybe they'll still get in. But if I can catch them quickly, if I can catch, you know, a criminal within 24 hours of ingress, turns out there's really not a lot of harm. I have to learn. I have to fix my systems. I have to, well, however they got in, I have to patch that hole. But they weren't able to actually cause harm because I started my defense from the, the result and worked my way up the, the process chain. So I guess the other question that I have is that there is, I've always heard this, thing about you know not necessarily you can never be so protected but you just want to make yourself not be the high hanging fruit but sort of mm -hmm. the low hanging fruit on the chain so is is that just implementing all this stuff or is it directing people to go somewhere else instead of in in my channel so i think it very much depends on the kinds of organizations that are out there particular to the super yacht industry where you know it's an amazing industry with a lot of great companies but people tend to be a little bit smaller in terms of organizational structure. They tend not to have the capability to bring in house a lot of that expertise. Uh, that's why service providers exist. And, you know, there are processes that you want to do. There are ways that you want to make sure that you're getting someone that actually is providing what you need them to. But, uh, you know, there is a, a, I have a strong belief personally that the, this industry is going to look very different three to five years from now in terms of cybersecurity. And a lot of that is gonna be spurred by, you know, adopting secure postures from vendors and the top-down approach of super yachts and management companies and other players are going to come and say, if you wanna do business with us, we need to see how you're going to manage your cyber risk and figure it out and, you know, that may lead to certain price increases, like you know, uh, an excise tax. But uh, 
it's going to happen because people can't sit and just tolerate this kind of giant, you know, risk sitting in the environment. If you think in the physical world, like a, a castle is the analogy I always like to give. You know, if you hardened your front gate, but you have a little portico off to the side, which is wide open, your gate's not very effective. So, so it's going to change. And I think service providers are going to be critical to, to that kind of long-term development and implementation. So I guess with changes, I guess it kind of comes into Corey then, I guess, as far as the uh, regulation side. I mean, I, Corey, you and I are both, I guess, in the communication space and we constantly see the increased demand, I guess, for more digitalization on board, whether it's, you know, autonomous ships or just more access to the internet. Um, so obviously regulations, you know, as Ben was getting, changes have to take place um, to prevent, you know, possible, you know, issues or tax or anything on that end. So I guess, you know, I'm going to jump to you and say, you know, what does sort of the landscape look like for regulations? Are we going to see changes and is it going to impact, you know, just specifically the odds? Is it going to impact, you know, service providers, you know, that are offering whatever services that they may be to these yachts? Sure. So I'd actually, before I kind of get into the regulatory side, I'd kind of like to dovetail a little bit on the conversation that you guys have been having um, and throw something in from, from our experience in the maritime industry. We're probably the most unprotected industry um, in the world. Yachts and management companies are slow to adopt this realistically until they're, until they're forced to. We've, so the clients that we've worked with, the large yachts at this point, we've been able to penetrate their networks very easily uh, from remote locations. We've gone to different super yacht marinas, logged into the super yacht marinas Wi-Fi network, and we're able to get to about 75 to 80% of the large yachts that were on that marina's network very easily, all the way to, I could print off stuff on individual yacht printers if I wanted to do that. So from an industry, we're extremely unprotected. It's very easily, easy for a hacker to take a look at like a communication company and the IP addresses that you're allocated and then start scanning those IP addresses and look for open doors. And, and just from what, we would, what we've seen, I would say 85 to 90% of the large yachts, cargo lines um, out there are completely unprotected. We were working with a partner who was doing some work with a, uh, with a large uh, tanker company, and they were able to penetrate all the way into the ballast control system on board a vessel within minutes. So yeah, the, the time that these people are in networks has been a long time, but we're seeing that kind of attack horizon come down very rapidly to within sometimes hours and days once they have an idea of what they're looking for and to, you know, to the point that, that both Stephen and Ben made earlier, it's all, it's all financial gain. So, you know, it's not about trying to navigate a yacht into the rocks. It's what kind of financial gain can I get? How can I get into, and what we've seen is, is man in the middle attacks. And we've seen that happen in the maritime industry a number of times where we've seen man in the middle where a management company or a charter company uh, between a potential charter client and a deposit gets paid, you know, somewhere else. So this industry is extremely vulnerable, um, is not protected and doesn't have currently from what we've seen, um, you know, the solutions in place. And a lot of it starts out to, again, what Steven and Ben have been talking about is some of the simple things is you really need to look at bringing in a third party. All IT companies do not understand uh, cyber and network security, but there are partners because we need as cybersecurity providers to work with them very early on when it comes to designing the shore side or the shipboard, you know, networks to be able to put the cybersecurity in place. So when we look at, you know, a large yacht or the management company and you have mm -hmm. potentially hundreds of different suppliers who are accessing those networks, how is that done and are these people clear? Do you look at the largest attack in the maritime industry was against Maersk, largest shipping company in the world, and that came in through a third party provider. And the only reason that they didn't lose their entire database and network is because one of their backup <laughs> server companies in Africa was actually offline because their power was out. So they had to fly a backup server from Africa to their first head. class ticket. What's that? It was a first class ticket oh, for yeah. the domain <laughs> controller and the tech. So, you know, to, to kind of push past that and to say, okay, with cybersecurity, you can pay, you know, here now, but if you get a, get attacked, 
there's a potential that that could elevate to 10 times what you would normally pay. And it's, there's a lot of cost effective solutions out there, even for small businesses, for the yachts and, and things that you can do and, and solutions from a company perspective that, that we've done and tried to work with our clients to be able to, you know, to kind of put in place. So I kind of wanted to piggyback on that from our experience in the maritime industry is, you know, banking and healthcare up here, maritime, yeah, we're kind of down here as to where we're on cybersecurity and have, have a long way to go. And I think that's kind of the part of why the IMO has been really pushing at the, at the regulation. So to kind of get back around now to your regulatory compliance side of it, um, the IMO has what we call IMO 2021, um, where it, it's really right now specifically looking at vessels, but the, the 2021 is you have to have as part of your safety management system. So as part of the ISM plan, you have to address cybersecurity. Now, what does that look like? Um, you know, the flag states have to weigh in on that. I know the class societies have started to weigh in, but how does that look from a regulatory compliance standpoint? And I think this is going to be the first step. I've attended a couple of the MSC meetings and, um, and talked to folks at the IMO um, in London. And they're at this point, they're not looking to make updates to the ISPS code specifically for maritime security because they feel that the code in and of itself right now is is a code to be able to address threats whether that's terrorists and physical threats to the vessel or facility or that cyber that the what they have in the code existing can be applied to cyber threats now i would be willing to bet that here in the united states that the coast guard will come out with additional regulations as part of the cfrs that cover um, what's under the Maritime Transportation Security Act. And I've already talked to people in the Coast Guard about that and how they're going to kind of do that. The first thing, though, the Coast Guard has to secure their own networks because they're, they're pretty far behind when it comes to securing their own networks. But I know there's going to be guidance that will come out for both vessels and facilities. And I'd be willing to bet that there'll be certain things that will port over into port state control as well. So it'll affect foreign flag vessels uh, coming here to the United States. So right now, I, I think from the regulatory compliance, what the IMO is doing is with this first phase for IMO 2021 is to say, let's just take a look at it. NIST has put out a great framework that everybody's looking at as kind of the baseline framework for that of how we're going to address it. But as we go on, and I think to Ben's point is in the next three to five years, cybersecurity within our industry is going to look a lot different in the large yacht, but also kind of the greater maritime industry as well. So do you think with these regulations, then it'll be more towards the commercial side first before they start rolling it out towards the leisure and super yachts and, and seeing how it goes there first, just because it's an easier place to control it? Or what are your thoughts on that? So, so right now, if you look at, at what the IMO has put out, it's really not to commercial large yacht or cargo. It's anybody who has, you know, an SMS. Anybody who has an ISM plan, basically, you have to address cybersecurity as part of that plan. So it's not really saying, okay, cruise lines, you need to do this. Cargo, you need to do this. Large yacht, you need to do this. It's really looking at the maritime industry in a whole at this point and to say, hey, if you have an ISM plan on board, you have to have cyber addressed as part of that. And, and like I said, I know the flag states will need to weigh in on this because ultimately they're the ones that will be responsible for determining compliance you know, to the IMO regulations. Um, and can I just offer one, one little point there that I, I, this is a little bit of conjecture now, but uh, I think another big player in this space that we haven't spoken about is the insurance market. That, uh, you know, the IMO took a very broad process-based approach and said, hey, you guys figure out what you want to do for your vessel. Uh, the class societies have gotten a lot more detailed, but their notations to date have all been optional notations, not required notations. But what's hanging in the offing, BIMCO came out with a model insurance clause for, for vessels. Now, that's not necessarily for yachts, but if insurance companies start saying, hey, I am concerned about cyber risk. I think I can pose a real risk to a, to a ship. I'm going to push you to do the optional notation if you want to get. Now, it's probably not going to start as a requirement. It's going to start as I'll give you a good break on insurance because your risk is meaningfully mitigated here. Or I'm going to start pushing up premiums for those that don't do it. 
But I think that there's going, and I think this will affect yachts more quickly than commercial in some sense, because they're much more able to act nimbly. You know, if you have a fleet of 50 tankers, it's a process to do it. For a yacht, they can say, okay, my insurance company came and said, I can make money if I do this. It's a much more sensible short-term project. And by the way, the IT networks and OT networks aboard yachts are significantly more sophisticated than we see in commercial vessels. When I get to deploy my, you know, we have this little box that we put on uh, boats. It goes and I work beautifully. I pull in the VLANs and I'm good to go. In the commercial setting, everything is a mess. So I think yachts are actually going to be an early adopter here because they'll be able to implement and there will be the economic case from the insurance companies more so than in the commercial context. You know, to, to that, that's a good point. And the insurance companies are, are kind of the, the, the unknown in all of this, because right now as a vessel, if you try to go to an insurance company and say, I want to get covered for cyber risk on my vessel, realistically, you can't, there's no, there's so many exemptions within those policies that it's almost impossible to meet that policy to get coverage. And the insurance companies right now really don't have a good idea of what does this space look like? You know, we're now just getting into the first regulations coming out from IMO, then down through the flag states. And like I said, class societies will get involved. The insurance is really the big unknown piece as to how they're going to step into this arena and could end up to be an even bigger driver than regulations. Maybe more so on the commercial than on the large yacht, but still I think on the large yacht, there could be some really interesting implications that if a large yacht goes in and says, hey, we have these protections in place, this is what we're doing, here's how we're mitigating, and all these pieces, it may be easier for them to get coverage for the uh, the cyber piece more so than a cargo or a cruise line. It, that's gonna be a really interesting piece and very good point, man. And I guess Steve, that from, from, I guess, the business side, though, you can buy cyber insurance, though, for a company. Yeah. And businesses Absolutely. do have yeah. it in place already, right? So, if I guess, if you had a company, cyber insurance, you know, it already is there. So, you would think that the other insurance companies for the outside would start to get on board, I guess, with it. Well, you would say, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can I comment? Make a comment? Yeah. Um, from an insurance standpoint, we're, we're an insurance agency and brokerage. Um, we are certainly seeing upticks in claims on the crime side from a cyber standpoint. And from, from our standpoint, we provide coverage and make it available to our customers. But where we're seeing a lot of up, up, uptick in claims is on the boat dealers and boat builders who move a lot of money around for deposits and whatnot. Mm -hmm. People are ghosting their email accounts, following what they're doing, and then sending emails to a CFO or a treasurer or whatever, asking for a deposit to be made to XYZ account. And, and there are fairly significant claims happening regularly. Now the coverage is available. It's getting people to realize that they have the risk buy the coverage and put in place some sort of safeguards to prevent it. So I guess my question to all of you is, is there some sort of a product and some sort of a service that we can market to whether it's a smaller company or a yacht or a super yacht or a shipping line that can help structure safeguards for these companies so that it's less of a risk because the coverage is available. It's just, you know, I think insurance companies are starting to get savvy that there's a lot more risk now than there used to be and premiums are starting to increase. There's what, and I can, and I, and good question, Jay. Um, Unfortunately, with cyber, there's no there's no magic bullet, and I would say probably between you know Stevens Company, Ben's, and mine, we each have a little bit different perspective and different tools of of how we approach it. Probably across the board, there's a lot of similarities, but how we look at you know each client is a little bit different because everybody's setup is a little bit different. Whether we look at a large yacht or a cargo line, cruise line, a shoreside facility. Um, communication company, whatever it may be, there's there's differences that we look at into the operations um, of that. And it would be great if we could say, hey, here's the magic box. If everybody has this, you know, we'll be okay and go get insurance from Jay, you know, but I think 
we're kind of a ways away from that from an industry because we're really still our attack vectors are really different than you know than shoreside just when you look at a ship and how that's you know how that's set up and the networks on board the ot side the it side and and how that works and you know with with a lot of vessels it used to be don't put your ectus on the network because that's a problem and we don't want to get corrupted data in the ectus and now well put your ectus on the network and we've got protection on that and and navigation so it's it's just interesting to see how things are you know changing pretty pretty quickly um, I'll also add to that that in cybersecurity, I don't like to think in terms of products and solutions and services. There's really three things you need to watch for people, process, and technology. Those three things brought together yield a service. So, you know, Corey joked about the magic box. I like to joke Atlas has a magic box that we do. But what that box does for us is enables our people to apply our technology and then bring our, the, when we see the vulnerabilities and issues, we bring our processes to fix it. So there's not something that doesn't, that is plug and play and done. It is a long and engaging process between vendor and client to really mature a cybersecurity program. And there's just one really great anecdote that I like to give. Corey mentioned the NIST cybersecurity framework. I am a huge proponent of it. It works for everyone from Fortune 500 down to a mom and pop shop. It's a way of thinking about cybersecurity. In the framework, there's something called implementation tiers, which basically rank the maturity of your program. There are four tiers. The most basic tier is called a partial implementation. That means you've got some security here, not here, and you're kind of, you don't really have a program, you just have scattershot. The highest level is not secure, safe, defended, it's adaptable uh, and it's a dynamic tier. And what that means is how nimbly am I able to evolve to confront tomorrow's threats? Because I don't know what they're gonna be, but I know that I need to evolve my program in real time. If something comes down the pipeline and I hear that you know this APT out of Romania, China, Russia, Iran, take your pick, I mean, everyone's act active here. Um, how able am I to defend against that information? Do I have the ability to figure out what's going on? Do I have the ability to apply defensive postures against it? And do I have the ability to respond to it if I actually do detect it? So, and it all comes down to that same tripartite schema of people, process, and technology. If you hang your hat on any one of those things, you're going to fail. It needs to be a joint effort of who, do I have the right people doing the work? Do I have the right technology here? And am I able to apply mature processes so that I can address emerging concerns? One, and to jump in there, one of the things to, to Ben's point that we really haven't talked about is the people part. I mean, we can have, you know, and also to Jay's point, we can put every magic black box that we want on board a vessel or part of a management company or shoreside support or whatever that is. But we have to train the shipboard crew, you know, on, on what, a phishing email looks like and, and how to operate within that network. And that's one of the biggest pieces that we've seen that's been, you know, missing. And, and that's tough when you talk about a large yacht crew is, you know, how much training do I have to put my crew through just to maintain compliance with the stuff I need to be compliant with in order just to keep my license to operate the boat. And especially in today's environment where it's, it's totally changed as to what it was six, seven months ago is the people training is one of the most important pieces. And it becomes in our, in my opinion, one of the most overlooked. That's one of the things we always try to look at is, Hey, we need to work with our vessel clients or our shoreside clients as a team and need to put procedures and things in place to help the people and then also to continue to train the people as we see those threats changing. Um, so the people side is, a, is, is big um, and, one, and a big overlook piece, the training part of it. Well, and I have a question too, I guess, is, you know, are there any online platforms? Like let's say I leave today and I'm like, all right, I wanna make sure I at least start going in the right direction and seeing where my you know, employees are at or where my crew is at as far as this. Is there somewhere that I can either do a quick training just to like catch them to see if they're doing something incorrectly, a quick online training system, and then, then go back and say, all right, in my budget for 2021, 
I want to implement these five things because I noticed from these results from training that our crew needs it or our employees need it. Is there somewhere that they can do that? Or do I have to start implementing a full IT, you know, risk management from the get go? No, not at all. Um, there's, there's plenty of firms out there. There's free training out there. It all depends on what you're wanting to train your employees on. Again, phishing, spear phishing, whaling, CEO fraud, uh, ransomware. I mean, the list goes on and on. And, and what you don't want to do, again, is take that one and done approach. You want to take it to where training is an ongoing effort. Um, a lot of times I'll see organizations that will require 12 trainings, except for they'll do them all in January. And then by the time you get to November, people have forgotten what they were trained on. Um, uh, we, at our, at our organization, we profess maybe, well, we profess a quarterly training uh, type of, of program to where you, it, it's, it's enough to keep information security awareness at the forefront, but you're not overburdening your, your organization. In regards to, you know, providers of that, there's all kinds across the internet. Um, you can look at firms like Know Before. Uh, which was actually founded by Kevin Mitnick, who was the the most famous hacker, um, uh, to to uh, again a very, uh, just a varied number of of free services that are very, that are available online. Um, the cost is actually not expensive at all uh, for even some that you that you must pay for uh, is as low as like twenty five bucks a, a person per year. So cybersecurity and cybersecurity information awareness training is not an expensive or overburdensome. Uh, activity, but one that should be ongoing. Uh, one quick point to Jay's uh, comments regarding uh, wire frauds is we're brought in a lot of times after the fact um, in helping identify how those those funds were transferred. And a lot of times we're finding, to Ben's point about processes, is is with authentication we're we're becoming more it's becoming more commonplace commonplace for multi-factor authentication. The same principle needs to be applied to uh, wire fund transfers and that you need to have multiple people approve that transfer so that you have a better opportunity than to catch um, when a malicious fraud is being uh, wire fraud is being attempted um, and, and, and those types of simple procedures will will 99% of the time stop that malicious wire fraud transfer from taking place um, just to add to that if you do the two-step uh, authentication of a transfer I highly recommend out of band, which means if the request came in over email, the second factor when you go follow up with somebody should be something that's not email, text, phone call, in person, whatever it should be, but don't use the same medium to authenticate that you do to process. But uh, the other thing that I just wanted to add for the, the training side, we say training, and I know that Steve and Corey, we're both thinking it, but we didn't actually say it. It's not just the training component, it's the testing component that you need to actively engage your you, you know, crew, employees, wherever it might be, and test that it's actually taken root. And we, we call it phishing testing in the industry, uh, and it goes hand in hand with training. When you fail a test, you train. But uh, it's really important to get metrics of who poses a risk and how do I address that. Something that we love doing when we, we manage a phishing testing campaign and training program for our clients is we try to gamify it. That you know we tell our, our client, buy a $200 Amazon gift card every six months and whoever does the best on all of the training and all of the testing gets that gift card. It is the single best investment that we've seen in security because it turns it that people, they start reporting phishing emails left and right because they think that they're going to win the card at the end of the day. And that $200 just motivates them in a way that calling it corporate training puts them to sleep turning it into that game or giving some kind of a, an element that makes it more engaging and gets better buy-in changes the, the numbers dramatically in terms of efficacy. Very interesting. Never, never thought that Amazon gift card would work so well. <laughs> One of, one of the things with the, with the training, I think you have to take a look at this. We've talked to um, a couple of, of, the, of the training schools, and I saw a Jay on here from, uh, from Blue Water, um, that there's training programs out there, but there's, you just don't see interest from, from the crew because it's something that up until this point is not, is not mandated. And, and I would be willing to bet that 
there's going to be some rude awakening with IMO 2021 compliance when you talk about that with vessels and being able to when the inspections come up and they haven't even looked at that because this is something that you know the IMO is taking very seriously um, because it is such a big problem again not just in the large out piece but kind of across the the spectrum so there's a there's a lot of training out there and I'd be willing to bet probably some of the other training schools as well have have courses but from what we've seen and talking to these guys, they it just, they're not getting participation and interest from people. However, again, with the 2021, that may, you know, change. So it's unfortunately you have to incentivize people with a $200 Amazon gift card, but you know, those are some steps you have to have to take. And you also have to look at when, especially when you talk about a large yacht is how do you do this training when they're in the middle of charter season, when they're in the middle of the Mediterranean and maybe they don't have the best satellite coverage how do you continue to be able to do this when they've got a million other things that are that are happening and going on and and kind of how do you work in and and help management i think is a is a really big piece um when it comes to it because a large yacht people their work schedule is much different than a cargo line the cargo line you know when they're transiting between ports besides ship work there's not a lot that's going on so it's easier to insert training whereas with a large yacht it's not it's not easy to uh uh, to do that. Um, one of the other things that I would that I'd also say from an industry perspective that we need to do is to look at from the beginning of the process. I know that that Berger sponsored this and I and I see Jim on here is as an industry is for us to start working with the IT companies and the boat builders to be able to build cybersecurity in you know, to the beginning plans from day one. So you can say, okay, well, we can put the magic boxes on the boats and do this and start looking at the whole process from the build perspective. And as an industry, that's one of the things that we should start doing is working together with folks, you know, like Jim and the, and the people at Berger and the other builders and manufacturers and designers to design this in to the very beginning part of the process. So we had um, actually one question come in uh, from a panel, uh, from a guest here. So how do we remotely provide the best protection for the family office structure? It's real simple, virtual private network. Um, anytime you're gonna start looking at, at virtual access or remote access, you wanna create that encrypted tunnel from uh, your employees' devices back to any digital assets that they're accessing. Um, it's, it's a, it's a Proven technology, it's simple to implement and uh, provides the, uh, the greatest value to small offices, family offices. I just want to add to, to Steve's point there that VPN is the best solution for end-to-end -end encryption. I might, you know, for a larger, more sophisticated organization, talk about software-defined networking, but won't get into that debate. Um, but I also want to remind you that end-to-end -end encryption is only as protected as the ends are. So if you've got a great security infrastructure at the family office where you're VPNing to, you also have to remember where you're VPNing from. And what we see, unfortunately, in today's kind of COVID world is someone in their personal home sharing computers with teenagers that are going to God knows what websites. Nobody's bothered to install antivirus for a decade on their personal computers. Nobody's looking at it, protecting it, or engaging it. So they end up potentially introducing the vulnerability back into the secure family office because of that remote connectivity. So you also want to think if this is going to become a regular thing, how do you extend the security beyond the perimeter of the office? And VPN is a good tool, but you also want to think either you're getting those people, their business provided uh, IT infrastructure, or you want some way to have a bring your own device policy where you can get some granular security controls involved. Uh, but you cannot just rely on, on the safety and security of that endpoint when nobody's actually controlling or protecting it. And I think that the second part of this kind of ties into the whole VPN, but if there's anything further to add with this question, um, is again, the best practices for protecting Protecting the family office structure with guests as they interact via technology on the owner's property and around the owners themselves. Again, it comes down to your your network being architected correctly. Um, when it comes to guest networks, uh, they really need to be implemented in such a manner that they go straight out to the internet. Don't pass go. Don't collect two hundred dollars. Right? Um, they 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 should never see 
um, any of the digital assets on the other side of the family's environment. Uh, you, you can do that through VLAN segmentation. You can do it through entirely separate networks. There's a whole different host of ways to do it, um, but you want to make sure you implement it in such a manner that keeps the guests truly separate and segmented from uh, the family's digital assets. So that would be similar to having like a yacht managed network on board, the same thing you would do in an office or so forth. You'd have a managed network separating the different users that are there. Is that correct? Absolutely. And it comes back to having managed devices, managed network devices that, that can actually deliver that type of uh, architecture. A lot of times what I see is, is where a, an audio visual firm has been brought in to also build the network. And when you start looking at audio visual companies, uh, they have two two primary um, uh, roles, deliver fast video and fast audio, right? Security isn't in that discussion. And so you wanna make sure, and a lot of times that, that equipment that's being used is, is unmanaged and it's, it creates this flat open network. And so you wanna take a look at what's being implemented, ensure that it's manageable and then able to uh, uh, be architected in such a manner to then create that separate guest environment. Uh, and just to add to that, and, and I know I'm a little biased here because this is what we do at Atlas, but some kind of active monitoring of what's going on. Uh, you know, it's you, you need to architect things correctly. Steve is 100% right. That, that, again, back to the castle example. If you don't have castle walls and the castle gate, you've lost the battle. Uh, but make sure that somewhere along the line you have security guards. Now, what that means is a little bit different for everyone. Uh, depending on how, what kind of resources they want to devote and how energetic they want to go. You know, you can get the 24 by 7 real-time armed guards patrolling constantly, or you can have someone come in every 30 days or every week or whatever periodicity you want, but it needs to be managed. You cannot just let it lie. We went on a, a, a large vessel recently, and the last time anyone looked at the firewall logs was two and a half years ago. Now, I, I imagine Corey and Steve might say, at least it was two and a half years ago. <laughs> but uh, it, it was really shocking that it just, it is set and forget. And security cannot abide a set and forget mentality. Someone needs to be actively involved, actively monitoring. If you don't have the ability to do that, there are outsource, places you can outsource that to. But you cannot just leave it as, I am good today, thus I am good tomorrow. It must be in, in some kind of periodicity managed, maintained, monitored, and, and supported. Thanks, Ben. And I just want to let everyone know that's on, on the call or on the Zoom here uh, that if they do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We can do a QA. and a um, I know I actually have a couple that I was going to address to the panel just to, you know, to see, how, see how they are as well, I guess, on a few things. Um, I'd seen a good quote um, that, you know, good cybersecurity begins with good leadership. And these functions are best led by a chief information officer who is trained, informed, and capable. Now, obviously we all don't have, you know, a CIO, et cetera, the company, but it does stem from leadership. So whether that's a captain or a person that's a head of your department or so forth, if they're leading the way, it should then stem down the chain. Is that sort of the way that you see it? Absolutely. Um, but there's also, as, as service providers, there's also uh, organizations that provide virtual chief information security officers and virtual chief information officers, right? Because technology and information security is different than navigating a boat. I would never want to tell a captain how to navigate his ship, right? Um, I can barely do a, a, a standard ski boat, let alone anything else. Um, I would probably do better in a paddle boat. But um, with that said, um, you, you, you want to find the people that have the expertise in delivering that type of service. And so contracting with someone on a part-time as needed basis for those virtual chief information officer, chief information security officer, uh, expertise is, is relatively, uh, uh available to, uh, to organizations at a, at a cost effective model. Um, we do this for our, um, family offices, uh, and, uh, and small and, medium-sized businesses across the, the globe, so. Um, I also just, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Ben. No, I, sorry, I just want to add to, to that point. Even if you do that, and I think that's a great return on investment, investing in that kind of VCIO, VCISO role, 
that doesn't mean that you know take the captain and managing company as leader of the boat uh that you can or, or ceo of a company uh can just push that responsibility off completely you still need to be engaged you still need to have reporting on metrics and even if you don't necessarily know all the ins and outs, you know, if I'm talking mean time to detection or percent patch management or vulnerabilities, average scores dropping, it doesn't matter. But you, you want to stay engaged because ultimately at the core security, while a super technical area is a business risk and business process. And if you, you should hold your VCISO or VCIO to account they break it down for you in a non-technical fashion. This is something that needs to always end up in the language of business risk, organizational risk. And that's a, you know, an important way to make sure that you're getting what you need to get and that if you can quantify that your risk has been mitigated. All right, and one other question I think we had here and then um, as we're already at our hour here, we'll kind of conclude with a few points. Um, it goes back to the third party risk. Um, you know, we mess message, you know, had a questionnaire uh, to our third party vendors, etc. Um, do we have any questions that, you know, we could think of today, like top five questions that we would need to know uh, that could help protect us or give us a bit more insight um, to what they've got going on? So uh, I'll, I'll take the first step at this. One of the most important questions is what reporting mechanism is in, is in place if you have a security incident that you tell me? Because if you look at a lot of kind of uh, SLA agreements or MSA agreements out there, there's not always a requirement that your vendor tell you that there's been a breach. And yes, if there's, you know, uh, breach notification obligations coming from any one of the 48 states that have an applicable law, fine. But for example, if there's a ransomware incident. I, as a client, would really want to know if my vendor got ransomed. Uh, and putting that in place and making sure that there's accountability there is the first step. Because once you know there's accountability, everything else can stem from there. But uh, that, that, that's, I would say, the number one question to put in place. One, one of the things that, that we look at when we're working with the client is, why does this vendor need access and what do they need access to? A lot of things when you look at, when you kind of start at that vendor access point is, why do they need access to the yacht or to that piece of information? Is it just convenience? Is there an actual need there? And when you start to look at that and who needs access to what on the shipboard side of it, there's a lot of third party vendors that you can realistically knock out of the game right away by just asking that question is, why do you need access and what is it? And is this something that through secure means that we can actually provide back to that vendor instead of giving them access. So I, we always kind of look at that point as, is, is what's the entry point and why, why do they need that and, and try to lessen the number of hands that are going into the, you know, proverbial cookie jar um, as kind of a starting point for us. I have a much longer rant on this, but TeamViewer. The rampancy of TeamViewer in the yacht market is incredible. And one of the things that we always do when we start with a client is we give them a list after two weeks of monitoring. These are all the team viewer sessions that we saw and their jaws drop. They thought, oh, my AVIT company had one or two sessions open or this, you know, one-offs. And then we come to them, there were 75 remote connections to the vessel. And they start going through and the ETO who took vacation leave to London wanted to remote in at three o'clock in the morning to do a little bit of administration from God knows where doing God knows what. And he could have just as easily been fired and they would have no clue that he was accessing the boat. There was no way to revoke his credentials. There was no management. There was no monitoring in place. Again, I have a much longer rant here. I'm just going to end it there. But a team viewer is, is a great tool, but a huge risk the way it's deployed today. One basic question that we always start with, because if information security is important to the organization uh, as a whole, you first off want to ask them, uh, ask your third party, what is their position on information security? Meaning, do they have a formal information security management system program? Uh, are they engaged with a certain uh, level of uh, compliance? Are they based on the ISO 27001, the NIST 800-171? 
COVID-5. Again, what are they basing their information security program on so that you can have a, a comfort level that they're actually taking information security seriously? If they just say, oh, we have some policies, um, I think we all know how often in organizational policies are read and, and, and understood. So, um, so you want to you wanna baseline their commitment um, uh, of information security. And if they go, yes, we have a formal information security program, here, here's how it's laid out, here's the scope of that program, here's the controls that we're, we're balancing ourselves against, and we're holding ourselves accountable to, then, then you've got a, a vendor that you, you can start feeling comfortable about doing business with uh, moving forward. That's great. Um, so I think since we're at that time, we'll do a quick conclusion and wrap up. At least the takeaways that I got is definitely in, implement a risk management program for a healthy cyber ecosystem. Uh, I think from what we've understood today that there's you know free outlets out there. It's not as expensive as we all presume it to be. Um, that there is ways that we could implement something um, that could be cost effective now versus detrimental later. Uh, obviously, what we just covered, get to know your vendors, what their cyber protocols are. And then obviously, you know, what regulations are gonna be coming. We have to prepare for change, uh, keep in touch with the IMO, what the regulations are out there, um, and just in general, uh, be better prepared. Diane, I'm gonna pass it back to you, I think, for the final, final words. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Ben, Stephen, and Corey for your insight today. This has been eye-opening to say the least. I've been jotting notes <laughs> while you've all been speaking to, to check a couple of things on our end. Um, for those of you who tuned in late and for those of you who want to go back and refresh your memory about some of the specifics that were discussed, this webinar will be on our YouTube channel in another couple of days. So check back and you will see it there. Uh, we want to make sure we thank again Burger Boat Company for their support for making this fantastic presentation possible. So thank you, Burger. And to those of you who have been enjoying our education series, please mark your calendars for next Thursday for our next session. It will be on the subject of mentoring. We have launched a uh, formal program with YPY, Young Professionals in Yachting, to create a mentor-mentee relationship. So we're gonna be talking about what the mentorship program is all about, what mentoring is even all about, because I think most people understand the concept, but not the nitty gritty. So we're gonna bring in some people who've actually been mentors and people who have actually been mentored. And so they're gonna share their insight into what they did, what they learned, and how it is absolutely a two-way street. It's never just the mentor imparting knowledge. It's definitely a, a two-way street there. So thank you all for attending. Thank you again to our fantastic speakers for your time and your insight. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.